I am um, Ramon Brasser. I work here at ELSI. I study the formation of planets and also some of their evolution, but mostly the earlier stages, because I think that we can understand a lot of what happened to the Earth and Mars and Venus and so forth if we actually understand more about their formation. So today I'm going to walk you essentially through a little journey, holding your hand as to how the solar system came to form. So very early on, about four and a half billion years ago, uh, the sun formed from a gas of cloud which was collapsing very slowly. I will show you an animation of that in the next slide. Then some of the gas and the solids in the disk that surrounded the sun. So as the gas cloud was collapsing, you form the sun and it is surrounded by a disk, which is like a spinning pancake. Sometimes, you know, when you go to a pizza parlor in Italy, you see somebody that holds a pizza on their hand and they're spinning it like this. And you notice that as he keeps spinning it, the pizza expands, right? Just imagine that the same thing is happening here with the sun. So you have the sun, it is surrounded by a very thin pizza, as it were, that is spinning around very slowly. And part of that pizza is expanding outwards and the inner part is going closer to the sun. That pizza around the sun is made up of gas and solids. Uh, some of these solids will then coagulate to form the terrestrial planets which will then happen in this stage, and all of this stuff is being smashed together through giant impacts such as the one that formed our moon, and eventually we end up with a nice set of planets at the end. So here's an animation of a molecular cloud. This is a computer animation. This is not from observation because these things take tens of thousands of years, and we only live about 80 years. You can see here that there's this spiral wave here where you have the gas falling together and forming the sun. But in, because the gas is rotating, it will start to rotate around the sun. And you get these spiral-like structures that you also see in spiral galaxies when you look at the sky. Now the animation is zoomed in. The central star, in our case the sun, is right here in the beginning and you see that all of this material is spiraling around the sun and you get these density waves and so forth. You see clumps of material that are here and here, which ultimately, or so we think, will form giant planets such as Jupiter and Saturn. So, we start with a gas, with a disk of gas and solids that surround the very, very early sun, like in the first 100,000 to 1 million or 2 million years of the solar system. We have small, tiny dust grains, like the dust that you get on your shelves and so forth that you need to wipe off every week. That sort of dust also existed in the solar system, where it's less of a nuisance than in your home. Um, the dust grains then form together because of gravity. You know, gravity attracts. Right? The sun holds the planets and so forth together, but gravity is everywhere. There's gravitational attraction between all of us in this room, even though we don't feel it. So the dust grains, they form together, and they form pebble-sized objects. You know, that like, like a small stone that you find on the beach or in riverbeds or something like that. And these pebbles are drifting into the gas. They're, they're revolving around the sun, but there's gas around. And you know, sometimes when you're biking and the wind is in your face, it's called a headwind. So these pebbles feel the headwind from the sun and it slows them down. So they then drift, they migrate towards the sun. The pebbles then stick together to form larger objects, planetesimals, essentially asteroids, you know, the stuff that we see around the sky. And then these form together to form small planetary embryos, like moon-sized to Mars-sized, Mercury-sized planets. And eventually, then if the gas is still there and we are lucky, we can get gaseous planets, such as Jupiter and Saturn. And if there's no gas in the disk, then we form terrestrial planets like the Earth, Mars, Venus, and so forth, which are mostly rocky, with a little bit of water, a little bit of other stuff, but it's mostly rock and metal. This is a very simplified story of how the planets in the solar system came to be. 
So you start with very small stuff that grows progressively larger and you can either go into gas giant planets or into terrestrial planets depending on whether or not there's gas still around. And to give you an idea of the time scale on which this happens, you form moon-sized, Mars-sized objects within 100,000 years to about 1 million years. And then those Mars-sized objects, as I'll show in a moment, will then all smash together to form planets the size of Earth and Venus. And that takes between 10 and 100 million years. So by about 100 million years, we're mostly done. So these are the terrestrial planets as we know them today. Venus, Earth, Mars, and so forth. And here's an animation of how the planets form. So you start with a lot of small stuff that is circling around the sun. I'm going to speed it up a great number of times. And you can see that I'm starting to get some waves. And I'm slowly clearing out the region here in the center uh, where I'm starting to form planets. Then in this region, stuff revolves slower. So it takes more time to form planets here. You can see that I've already got a couple of planets here. And then uh, in the outer edges, it takes even longer. So by this time, I have enough, uh, I have a little bit of material left, so I'm starting to get these giant impacts, such as what you have, for example, for the, the moon and so forth. The giant impact that formed the moon. Um, as you can see, the number of ellipses in this animation is decreasing. That is because stuff is colliding with each other and then forms larger and larger bodies, but also fewer and fewer of them. So I start with a very large amount of small bodies, and then progressively I get larger bodies of the size of planets, but fewer of them. And towards the very end of the animation, I still have some other stuff flying around on very strange, very highly elliptical orbits. Stuff is ejected out of the solar system. Some stuff will fall onto the sun. And ultimately, in the top case, I end up with four planets, one, two, three, and another tiny one here. And in this middle case, I have also four planets, with this one being on a very highly eccentric orbit. I have a tiny one there and another two or three here. Even though I start with the same simulation, but I just run it on a different computer, I get a different outcome. So our solar system is unique. If I were to reset the clock back 4.6 billion years ago, and I would run the same experiment again, I would get a different outcome. I will not get four in small planets in the, in, in the inner part and four gas giants at the end. I will not get an Earth. I will not get a Venus. It's unique. Because every simulation is different, and every system is unique and different in its own way. So if we want to understand what the Earth is made of, right? I mean, if you take a sample of rock, right, how do you know what it's made of? You can analyze it, but is it a good idea of what is very deep inside the Earth? I'm not sure that we know. Right? If I want to un analyze what the Earth is made of, I have to go very deep in the Earth, but I cannot drill 2,000 kilometers in the Earth. It's just not possible. We can use a proxy. There is material that is still flying around the solar system today, which is raining on us every once in a while, in meteorites. We have stuff that sometimes falls from the sky onto the Earth in the form of meteorites. And what you can do is you can classify these meteorites with something called cosmochemistry, where you analyze their composition, you analyze uh, uh, their structure, and so forth, and then you can classify them into different groups. These, these meteorites are very old, about the age of the solar system, 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago, and they're very primitive. So they have not been processed. They basically formed their and they stayed there flying around the solar system for the past 4.6 billion years. Okay? And we want to try to use these meteorites as an idea to understand what the Earth is made of. So the first group that we know are what is called enstatite chondrites. Enstatite chondrite. They're very primitive. They're mostly magnesium silicate. So they have magnesium and silicon and oxygen in them, and that is mostly what they're made of. The Earth's mantle is also made of a lot of magnesium silicate, actually. They are also very reduced. So in other words, all the oxygen is essentially in the silicate. There is no free oxygen available. And they are very, very dry. 
in these meteorites, there's almost no water. There's almost no nitrogen. There's almost no carbon and so forth. They're very, very dry, which means that most likely these encetite chondrites formed very close to the sun. There it is hot, so the volat volatile material like water, which evaporates at 100 degrees or so forth, will then be evaporated, and you're only left with very dry rock, which is what these encetite chondrites are. Then we have another group called the ordinary chondrites. These are called ordinary because they are the most common meteorite that falls from the sky. The ordinary chondrites are mostly made of stone, so they're not that hard, compressed magnesium silicate that you find in the encetite chondrites, but they're more like stone. So if you go to a beach or to a riverbed and you pick up some stones, you might get lucky and one of them is an ordinary chondrite. You just wouldn't know because we don't have the expertise to be able to distinguish such rocks. They're mostly made of olivine, which is, I think is an, is an iron silicate and so forth. And they also have some metal in it that is oxidized. So they have a higher fraction of oxygen in them than the encetite chondrites. They have more metal in them as well. And they also have more volatiles. These have a little bit of water in them, about the same amount as the Earth has. Right? So it's about you know, one thousandth of the mass of these objects is water. You just don't know it because it is embedded in the rock, but it's there. If you heat it up, you'll find actually that there's water. In there. The third group is called carbonaceous chondrites. These are thought to form very far from the sun where it's very cold. So they form in an environment where the temperature is about 50 degrees above absolute zero. So it's about 220 degrees below zero. If you were to be out there in that temperature, you would freeze solid in a few seconds. That's how cold it is. It's, it's absolutely devastating for any, any life. But they form in there. And because they form so cold, they did not lose their volatiles. They keep most of their water. They keep their nitrogen. They keep their carbon, hence carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, and some of the minerals have been altered because of water. As you know, for example, water reacts with everything. Right? You get mildew and so forth on your walls because it's water reacting with something. If you pour metal in water, it oxidizes, in particular the iron. Water is reactive. Water alters the compounds that exist within the meteorite. And we know that there's water in there because if you analyze these meteorites, you find water and you find the evidence of water in the minerals that have been altered by it. So these are the guys that delivered the water to the earth. Okay, these were the ones that brought us all the rain that we're getting every day in the weather right now. So let us run a simulation now of terrestrial planet formation. These are the initial conditions. So I have Jupiter here. This is the distance to the sun on this axis here. Jupiter is a little about five. The Earth is at one right here. And this is the eccentricity of the orbit. It measures how elongated the orbit is. So if the orbit is perfectly circular, which I can't draw, but you just have to imagine it, then the eccentricity is zero. And if I have a very elongated ellipse, then the eccentricity is 0.8 or 0.9 or something like that. Okay? Encetite chondrites, which are the magnesium silicon rich bone dry meteorites, form here. The ordinary chondrites, which are in between, a little bit of water, stone, metal, form in the middle. And the carbonaceous chondrites, which have all the water and all the carbon and the nitrogen and so forth in them, all the stuff that life depends on, they come from farther out. So Jupiter is going to perturb all this stuff. You see that I'm starting to form some planets right away, and the growth is from the inside out. I have some planets here, but I don't have planets here yet. That is because here it takes longer for the planets to accrete than it is here, because here I go around the sun in about half a year, but here it takes me about three years, which is a factor of six. So here I form the planet six times faster than about here. Notice also that the color of these planets is changing. In the beginning, they're mostly red. There we go. So in the beginning, they're mostly red because they accrete the stuff from the encetite chondrites, but eventually 
this stuff, the carbonaceous chondrites and the ordinary chondrites, are being pushed inwards towards the terrestrial planets by the action of Jupiter. Okay? So you see this one is now becoming orange because he is, he is feeding off of material in this outer disk, and these guys are now becoming green because, you know, the red is given some blue material and you end up then somewhere here in the middle, right? I start very dry, I then have some of the blue material come in and I end up somewhere in the middle, and that is where Earth's water is coming from. I'll play it one more time. So I start here, I have local accretion, some of the ordinary chondrites and carbonaceous chondrites end up in the planets in the Earth analog, which is sitting roughly in this region here. And because of Jupiter, we are actually getting some of that water. So it's only because of Jupiter. If Jupiter was not there, we wouldn't have as much water on the Earth as we do today, because there is no agent that is able to push the material that is farther away from the sun, these carbonaceous chondrites, onto the Earth. Okay? So ultimately, after the simulation is done, what happens is that I end up mostly with three planets. I know there are four, but in the simulations you get four plus or minus one. So sometimes I get three, sometimes I get four, sometimes I get five, uh, sometimes I even get six, but on average we get about four. In this case I get three. So I get something that looks like Venus, I get something that looks like Earth, and I get something that looks a little bit like Mars. It's a bit heavier than Mars, but you know, that's fine. In another simulation, it would be. And I have some leftover material sitting here, which is essentially not being cleared out by Jupiter and by the other planets. But what is important is that even though in this region here, very close to the sun, I started out with the red material, the dry material, because of Jupiter, some of the blue material, which was here, the carbonaceous chondrites, ended up in the planets and that's why they have this nice green bluish color, which means that they have accreted some water. And what you can then also do is essentially you can say, okay, if I now analyze these planets, I can determine how much material in the planets is from the enstatite group and the ordinary group and the carbonaceous group. The last thing I want to discuss is the moon formation event. So the Earth has a large moon. Uh, the moon is about one and a half percent of the mass of the Earth. It's one over 81, to be precise. Um, it's pretty far from the Earth. It's about 60 times the radius of the Earth from us. So how did it get there? Because Mars has two small satellites, but they're very, very small. They're only a few kilometers in size. They're, they're tiny compared to both the planet and the moon itself. But Earth's moon is very big. Venus has no moon, neither does Mercury. So how did the Earth get its moon? Well, we think through a giant impact. So what we think happened was that the Earth was sitting there going around the sun and a, an object the size of Mars, roughly the size of Mars, struck the Earth and then because of gravitational interaction between the material from the Earth and from the impactor, that then formed a disk around the Earth here you have a blob of material which is spinning around the Earth. Eventually it has another collision with the Earth, but you can see you form this sort of very strung out material that is orbiting the Earth. And you have a lot of other stuff that is just sitting around and spinning around the Earth. The idea is this object, it came in, it hit the Earth, and it came with such force that you basically tore it apart. If you have a rock and you're trying to tear it apart, it's very, very difficult to do that. But if you're somebody like Superman, you might be able to tear it apart if you do it with enough force. Okay? This thing comes in incredibly fast. You know, we're talking tens of thousands of kilometers per hour, much, much faster than any aeroplane is able to, come, to go on the Earth. It hits the Earth at an angle and then it is kind of torn apart because of the gravitational forces, as you can see here. And you form this blob on both the Earth that accretes a lot of material from there. You have material which is then spinning around the Earth 
And eventually, after a couple of days of that, all that material going around the Earth, colliding with itself, we form the moon, just one moon. And then, because of tidal evolution, the moon will be pushed away from the Earth, and after four billion years, four and a half billion years, it is where it is today. Tide, tides, we're all familiar with tides. If you go to the beach, right, you have low and high tide. That's because of the gravitational attraction of the moon. But in, of course, when the moon was much closer to the Earth, the tides were much stronger. So the tides from the Earth push the moon away. That slows down the rotation of the Earth. That's why we have a 24-hour day right now. But a few billion years ago, it was like 20 hours or even 18 hours, and the moon was closer. It's being pushed away, and we end up with the Earth-Moon system that we have today. So this is my last slide, a summary slide. So Earth is composed of a mixture of meteorite groups, right? We think that is what the current analysis of samples from the Earth and meteorite groups seems to indicate. Earth experienced a very violent and destructive impact about four and a half billion years ago, which formed the Moon. Also, Earth accreted a small amount of water from carbonaceous chondrites from the outer solar system. I say a small amount. Now, when I was living in Taipei before I came here, I never thought that the Earth was a dry planet because it rained almost every day. Okay, even here in Tokyo, the, this summer has been incredibly wet. I think we've set a record for the amount of rain. And when my colleagues tell me the Earth is a dry planet, I said, have you been outside? But it's true because most of the water is actually on the surface, or at least half of it, or something like that. But it's still a very, very, very small amount of the total mass of the Earth. It just happens to be concentrated mostly on the surface. If you run numerical simulations, you will find that the composition of Venus and Mars should be fairly similar to that of Earth, i.e. it's made from the same material and you end up with roughly the same composition. And all planets through, formed through violent collisions. As I showed you halfway through the talk, you had all these, these orbits which were spinning around, and eventually stuff was accreted, and you formed larger planets as the number of bodies decreased. So our, our terrestrial planets formed violently and rapidly uh, from a mixture of material that gave us the Earth as we know it today. Thank you. <laughs>